Uh, so to start off, um, you know, researching Bruce Lee, writing about Bruce Lee, getting to know his life, there's a lot of myth to make your way through, um, I would say, from everything I've read and everything I've seen in your book. Uh, one of the things you do really well in the book, I would say, uh, is portraying blow by blow some fights that he had. Um, in particular, there's the Wong Jack Man fight, a legendary fight in the Bruce Lee mythos, um, where your description is really evocative. Uh, if I could share a little bit of that, um, just so everyone can hear that. Uh, Bruce bellowed and charged. His frenzy punches pushed Wong Jack Man backward toward a dangerous spot in the main hall. Bruce's Kung Fu studio was previously an upholstery store, and there were two showcase windows with raised platforms to display mannequins. On the defensive, Wong Jack Man backpedaled toward the raised platform. Unaware of his surroundings, he tripped on the platform and crashed into the window. Uh, slumped at a 45 degree angle, Wong was trapped, unable to stand up or roll away. Uh, now to hear the rest of that, you will have to buy the book. But for the time being, I'm kind of curious uh, how you, Matt, were able to piece together such an evocative description from something that much legend swirls around. Uh, so if anybody's seen Birth of the Dragon, which just came out, it's pretty bad. Um, but it was told from Wong Jack Man's side, and so this is the most famous fight in Kung Fu history. Uh, the, the challenge match has been told like at least a dozen times in various uh, film, on theater. Linda has her version, which she's told in her book and in the movie Dragon, a Bruce Lee story. And Wong Jack Man has only done one interview in which he talked to his student who told his story. Uh, and so I had both of them, and they don't agree. <laughs> so what I did was I ended up interviewing David Chin, who was Wong Jack Man's friend who set up the fight. Uh, and the reason I sort of trusted his take on things was because uh, he agreed with Linda's on most of it. So I figured if someone who was Wong Jack Man's friend uh, agreed with the opponent's side, then that was probably as close to the truth as we were ever going to get about this fight. Um, and so I interviewed him and then I put together the two stories and then the final little bit was uh, one of the advantages I had in writing this book is that I actually fought a challenge match in China when I lived at the Shaolin Temple and I've, I've seen a lot of them and so I have a sense of what happens in challenge fights and one of the things that happens is even very experienced martial artists panic and what happened in this fight with Wong Jack Man is that he was overwhelmed by Bruce Lee and turned and ran. And his students for years have said, that's ridiculous, that never happens. And I'm like, no, I actually have seen guys do that. Because no matter how good you are, um, at that moment, you don't know what's going to happen. And so that's how I ended up writing that story. So it was a mixture of corroboration and personal experience that allowed you to come to some kind of truth on that. Uh, you, you try to do your best to get which side of the story, place a judgment, and then use your own experience to weigh and balance the difference. Great, great. And in terms of materials that you used, in addition to um, people's stories, written accounts, things like that, I'm just curious to hear, uh, as a biographer, what tools were available to you, which individuals were available for conversation, um, how you kind of piece this together? Uh, so there's, no one has written a proper biography of Bruce Lee in 45 years, which kind of upset me. I thought, you know, any, any white guy who does anything gets a biography, and the Asian guy can't get one. So I really wanted to set out to write the full comprehensive book. Now a lot of people have written about Bruce Lee from different perspectives, his martial arts life, or people who were personal friends, and so I pieced those together as best I could, and then I went out and interviewed over 100 people to try to get, when the stories didn't match, try to figure out what happened or where there was thin areas of his life. And so I spent six months in Hong Kong and ended up talking to childhood friends, people he went to school with, um, people we worked with, his girlfriends, all sorts of things. Yeah, and coming from your martial arts background too, uh, with your knowledge of different styles, uh, how did you approach writing about and portraying Jeet Kune Do, the style that Bruce originated? Uh, so Bruce Lee started uh, practicing Wing Chun when he was in Hong Kong, uh, and then he got to the States and he realized that Americans are really big. Um, and that was one of the things he said, you know, a lot of moves that worked in Hong Kong don't work against uh, students that he had that were 100 pounds heavier and 8, pound, eight inches taller. Uh, and so he started to pick up things that he, his students knew. He was into boxing, he learned some judo, uh, and he really was 
whenever he went to a new environment, he tried to adapt himself to that environment, and that became his sort of guiding philosophy. It's really a sort of immigrant's philosophy. When you come to somewhere new, figure out what works, where it's at, and how to fit in. Uh, and so Jeet Kune Do was really his attempt to amalgamate all the things he had learned from Western combat with Eastern martial arts. And what were some of the styles that found their way into that mixture? Uh, so <laughs> primarily it was boxing, uh, kung fu, uh, but also fencing, which was unique about Jeet Kune Do. His older brother was a fencer, and his older brother taught him some fencing. And Bruce couldn't stand not being better than everyone. Um, this is a kind of defining characteristic and why he ultimately succeeded because he couldn't stand being second best and his brother tells this story Which is when he was a teenager He couldn't touch me and then when he came back from America I couldn't touch him and that's the wow. way Bruce Lee was he was always secretly practicing uh, And so fencing became part of the style of Jeet Kune Do. In the book too you do touch on uh, Bruce's love of dance which you refer to as his other great passion if you may know this uh, he was a cha-cha champion in Hong Kong <laughs> Um, and you can see a little bit of that in the nimbleness of his moves. How else do you see that manifest in Jeet Kune Do and in Bruce's style in particular? Well, I think you can see it in the film. Um, what, what often happens when really great martial artists think they're going to be the next Bruce Lee is they get on film and they look stiff as a board. Because what wor works on, in the ring is often being really solid and having a few things you do really well. Bruce Lee had this great rhythm and timing in his dance moves that he translated and combined with his martial arts. So what you're seeing in a way is a kind of dance martial arts. Um, and that kind of rhythm is why his, his fight scenes are powerful in a way that wouldn't necessarily work on the street, but are incredible. Like when you watch him do those things on screen, you think, hey, he's the baddest dude on earth. Um, and that's, he was able as an actor and a dancer and a martial artist to combine those three and give that feeling to audiences. And, and throughout the book, you also detailed the different ends that Bruce had used his skills for, um, used his knowledge of the martial arts. What were his goals throughout his life, and what did he end up focusing on as his chief goal? So his, uh, the thing to understand about Bruce is his father was an actor, and I think he spent his whole life trying to outdo his dad. Um, and growing up, he started off acting in films his father was in. That's how his career started. Uh, and he made 20 films Cantonese films in Hong Kong before he was 18. Not one of them were kung fu films. So he really was an actor chronologically first before he got into martial arts. He came to America and he said, in one of his interviews he said, I looked around and thought, they don't have much use for a Chinese actor in America, so I'll just, the hell with it, I won't try. And at that point he thought, he was about 18 or 19, he had just started college at the University of Washington. He wanted to be a, the Ray Kroc of kung fu. He was going to open kung fu studio franchises all across the country. Mm. And for about five years, that's all he dedicated himself to, teaching kung fu and becoming as good at kung fu as he could. Uh, and then he was randomly discovered by a producer in Hollywood and given the part of Cato and the Green Hornet. And suddenly, his two worlds merged. He took his love of acting and his love of martial arts and became a martial arts actor. And you can really see the fusion from Green Hornet on of the two aspects of his personality. A lot of Bruce's life, from what you portray in the book, is a fusion. You know, the uniting of different styles, his life in Seattle, as well as his life in Hong Kong, um, and really his career, too, where he had a career in Hong Kong, and then his career in the US, uh, starting, as you said, uh, playing Cato in The Green Hornet. Um, what about his persona, in your mind, was able to bridge that gap, bridge that Pacific gap? Um, one of the interesting things I discover in the book, everybody knew Bruce Lee was Eurasian. They thought he was a quarter German. Actually, his heritage, he was an eighth Dutch Jewish, a quarter English, and five eighths Han Chinese. And so growing up in, uh, there's a famous story when he was growing up in Hong Kong that uh, the other students didn't like how good he was getting. So they tried to kick him out of class by telling Yip Man, his teacher, well, he's not full Chinese. We can't teach anyone who's not full Chinese. Then he gets to America and he's discriminated against because he's not white. And so I think there was something about not being either or. He was not fully Chinese, he was not fully American, um, that gave him a sense of uh, universality uh, and a desire to kind of bridge the two parts of himself and the two cultures he grew up in, born in San Francisco, raised in Hong Kong, went to college in the US. And so in many ways he represents a kind of 
post-racial um, person, and he espoused this in his life. When people asked him, do you think of yourself as Chinese American or American, he would say, I like to think of myself as a human being because under heaven we're all the same. And in taking it further and talking about the two cultures that Bruce had existed in, um, you know, seeing Enter the Dragon, we know that there was nothing like this in U.S. cinema when it came out. It was unique. Um, how did his work fit in with what was happening in Hong Kong at the time, uh, since he had made three films in the years before Enter the Dragon had come out? Uh, specifically, what do you mean by the movies in Hong Kong? How did um, other martial arts movies that existed in Hong Kong, were, was his work similar to that? Was it different? What did he introduce that was an innovation in terms of Fist of Fury, the big boss, Way of the Dragon? Uh, so what was interesting about Bruce's career in Hong Kong is they had already started making kung fu movies. Um, the Chinese Boxer by Jimmy Wang Yu had come out and was a huge hit in, I think, 1970 or 1969. Uh, and so Bruce came in and rode a trend that had already started, but he blew it up. Uh, and so in many ways, Bruce would land on things and through his sheer force of personality and talent, make it bigger than it was. And so the big boss in Fist of Fury and Way of the Dragon took something that was there and made it huge um, because Bruce added like a sort of impact to his kung fu that no one else had. Most of the uh, Chinese actors, and even like when you watch John Saxon try to kick, you can see what the difference is between an actor who knows a little bit of kung fu or a little bit of martial arts and somebody who's actually a master of it. And that's what Bruce had is that he was an actor for real and he was a for real martial artist. And there's very rare that you have both. You have Chuck Norris, who was a very good martial artist and a rotten actor. Uh, and then you have people like John Sack, sorry, I know. He's gonna get me. He's a mediocre, he's a mediocre actor. I'll, I'll qualify that for the YouTube audience. Um, but, uh, and so that's the thing that Bruce Lee had, is he had both. Yeah, and, and getting to the movie we just saw, Enter the Dragon, uh, you had mentioned John Saxon, who played Roper in the film. Um, it's an interesting story, an interesting anecdote you share in the book about how there was the fear from Bruce Lee that John Saxon would be given the main role, that once again he would be playing Cato to his Green Hornet. Uh, what did what was Bruce able to do to make sure that that wasn't what was going to happen? Right. So if you look at the movie, I think it's fascinating because we think of this as Bruce Lee's movie, but if you examine it, they didn't think Bruce could carry a movie by himself. So they had a multiracial cast, white guy, black guy, Asian guy. But they only gave one of them an actual moral arc. And it wasn't Bruce, it's Roper. He starts off as a rogue and he becomes the good guy. So Bruce read the script and was like, oh my God, they're gonna take the script away from me. Like, I'm gonna film this thing, they're gonna go back to California, they're gonna recut it and I'm gonna be Cato again. I'm gonna be the second to the Roper, who's the charming rogue who turns into a hero at the end. Uh, so first he tried to fire the screenwriter, <laughs> which they didn't, they didn't let him do. Uh, and then he really tried to fire the screenwriter, which finally happened. Um, but the, the funniest story, and this, this happened, John Saxon told me this as I was uh, at his house in, in LA. Uh, he invited Saxon over to his mansion in Hong Kong, Bruce does, and he says, uh, show me your kick, so John does, and uh, Bruce says, eh, not bad, let me show you mine. And he says, okay, so he hands him a big kicking shield, he goes, stand right there, and he goes behind him and he puts a chair behind him, and then he goes, Wah! does the Bruce Lee kick, blasts him back, Roper goes like, uh, hits the chair, falls to the ground, breaks the chair. He's lying on the ground, he looks up and Bruce comes over with this concerned look on his face, and Saxon says, don't worry, don't worry, I'm not hurt. And Bruce says, I'm not worried about you. You broke my favorite chair. 